go, go. Right now. We're live right now. Yay. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> so there's no music. So da -na 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 -na. Ooh. okay. Thanks. Welcome to any last good. words. <laughs> That's my summed up version of my intro song. Watch that get copyrighted claim too. <laughs> Anyway, oh my gosh. Thank you for joining me again, Mark. I really appreciate it. Yeah, Joe. I mean, it's totally my pleasure. I enjoy working with you in all the capacities we do. So I'm happy to be back here. So thanks. Thank you. And I've been I've been uh been keeping an eye on your show that you got, Brain mm. Burrow, that you started. Mm. Awesome show. Oh, there you Product go. Placement, there you I didn't, go. yeah, yeah. You can blur there that you out. Maybe. Get, it, yeah. get it in where you can put it in, sir. <laughs> <laughs> But you're doing you're doing exceptionally well for the the you know you haven't been on very long you're doing really well. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm inspired by the people that have been doing this for a while, like a certain person on this call right here. Uh, so I thank you for the inspiration. So you know, y'all uh, have been doing this, and I'm learning from you. So thank you for saying that, though. Ah. I just, I, I'm just excited to see who you got next on. Are you able to tell us who you have next on? Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm able to tell you. Uh, actually, next I have a uh, a close friend of mine who's a director out of Philadelphia. Her name is Bianca Crespo, and she actually was in Hollywood for a while, but she moved back to Philadelphia to kind of revitalize the scene out there. And um, she and I work on a couple of things together. She's not on Facebook but she's going to be on on Wednesday and then they, it'll be out there a few days later. So she has a very unique perspective and I really appreciate how she wants to bring back sort of the film industry to the Philadelphia scene. So it'll be interesting to see what she says, but thank you for giving me a little plug for the show coming up. Oh, you're going to get plugs all over the place there. So. <laughs> nice. You know how this works. I got to mention it a couple of times. I want people to go over and see who haven't seen it yet. So, because I think they'll enjoy it. I love the concept of it. Tell us the concept of your of your show. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Again, wow, very impressed that you're giving me like all this uh, softballs <laughs> to help uh, to help my show. Yeah, the concept of the show is really about um, specifically. There's two different portions, but I seem like I'm focusing mainly mainly on the guests, and it's really about talking to people that are in the industry, the horror film industry, who are actors or directors or both or writers, and really spending time having them talk about themselves, not necessarily the projects they're working on, but what motivates them? What are their struggles day to day? How do they survive some of the chaos that goes on in their lives? And it's really f focused on the guest and I don't really know where it's gonna go. It's almost like a mini therapy session. And you know, I've had a lot of guests at the end of it say, wow, this is really different. This was, I was not expecting to talk about myself so much. And, um, you know, obviously David Howard Thornton, right, who I met on your show, again, thank you. If you watch his show, he mentions Art the Clown one time. And at the end of it, he just revealed to me that it was kind of nice to not talk about Art the Clown for once and talk about it. But there's two elements to this that I think are important for Mental Health Month. One is the people on the show themselves are saying that they feel good talking about themselves because how often do people do that? And then two, I've had a lot of, listeners and viewers contact me and say, wow, that was a really powerful interview. I watched, you know, so-and-so who seems to be so confident, but to hear that she's struggling with self-sabotage or lack of confidence, it was really an eye-opener. It made me feel like I wasn't alone. That's awesome. That's really awesome. I'm so proud of you. Oh, thanks, <laughs> and I'm so happy for you, too. I mean, that, like I said, you're doing exceptionally well for the short amount of time you've been on. I'm super impressed. I really am. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, I don't have multiple different shows on. I know that you are out there with, you know, the, the shows for the Any Last Words and you're doing your cooking shows and I know you're filming. So we all do a lot of things. I just happen to focus on this specifically right now. So equally impressed by you, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what was that about tell me what tell me why it's so hard to take a compliment there i don't know so i like your mug that's nice that's pretty <laughs> it's a nice diversion it's all right i get it <laughs> it's not about me sir this is about you right now and it's about other people right now <laughs> that's right well yeah i mean i think that's a good question joe i mean you're you're advocating and wanting to come back on the show because it is mental health awareness month i'm just wondering um, you know, what motivated you? Why, why is this a topic that's important to you? Um, well, it's important to me, I guess, because I know a lot of people mm -hmm. um, that struggle with it. I've worked at places. Um, I, I've worked in prisons. I've worked in mental mm -hmm. health facilities. And I've got to see a lot of people and their families and their friends and how it affects them. 
I mean, everybody, it, it's not just a, a sole person that's affected by this. It's, it's everybody in your world that's affected by that. And that that's trickles right. in their lives as well. So it just, just to see that domino effect, is just always, you know, and then how uninformed a lot of people are about things, uneducated. Um, a lot of people aren't very sympathetic because of that too. And it, it's just, I think if people were more educated, then, you know, maybe we can get through this a little better. Mm -hmm. Um, And on top of, I suffer from a handful of mental illness illness myself. So just Hmm. trying, I guess, just trying to understand, educate myself and help educate others in a nutshell. Yeah, that's a fantastic goal, right? I think as human beings, first of all, as human beings, you've probably heard me say this before, we're imperfect, right? We're emotional. Even on the best of days, we're still impacted by things around us. We get jealous, we get angry, we get sad, we get happy with things that influence our emotions. And um, and then we live, you know, communicating with imperfect people, other people, and it's just sort of spiral, you know, spirals out of there. So I think, you know, either, even if people aren't specifically diagnosed with something, we all suffer from different levels of anxiety or depressive symptoms and things. So I think to your point, uh, the more we can sort of educate ourselves and embrace our feelings as opposed to pushing them away and judging ourselves. A lot of times, I don't know about you, Joe, whenever people feel a certain way, they feel upset or they feel, again, angry or jealous. They're like, oh, why am I feeling this way? And then they feel worse about themselves. So I don't know what your thoughts are on the spiral that sometimes happen with emotions. Oh, no, I no, I totally agree with that. I totally agree. And it doesn't, um, you know, and if you don't know how to undo your funk, it's just going to make it worse. Mm. And then, per, you know, again, it just affects everyone else around you. And that can make, you know, like if you have a spouse and you're just, you're in a down mood, you can't get out of your down mood. And then it starts affecting your spouse. Like, well, is it me? Like it gets them yeah. thinking and then they start feeling, it's almost contagious in a sense. Yeah, a- I don't want to say... So. No, that's a great way to say that, right? Uh, there's a term called cognitive distortions, which are sort of what goes on in our own mind a lot. And there's a cognitive distortion called personalization, where we look at people that seem to be upset. So if I'm looking at you, Joe, and you seem to be distracted, and you're not, but if you are, if I was suffering from personalization, I'd be like, oh, you know, am I not engaging enough? Am I having issues? And then I start in my own mind, having the spiral, then I may act a different way. And then you're like, okay, why is Mark all stressed now? Yeah. So to your point, using that contagious perspective is definitely something I think it's very applicable. So great call out with that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the best my brain can filter it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. And, and it's okay. And it's about being, you know, it's about accepting your own imperfections. And then as much as you can surrounding yourself, and it's not always easy to do with people that are equally as supportive as well. Right. And you, you've worked in mental health for how long? <laughs> I, I started in mental health in 1994. Okay. So yeah, so at Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic in uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I can't remember if I mentioned this before, but I worked on a uh, program it's called the Alcoholism and Family Interaction Initiative. And what we would do is we would videotape and audio tape family members who were eating dinner together. So imagine, you know, if somebody was recording you know, your family eating dinner together, we would leave the tape. I mean, it was back then it was tapes, leave it on all the time. So that nobody knew if it was there or not. And people just acted normally as they would. And we would go through and assess that. Right. So if a son, an 18 year old son, I remember this very vividly said, you know, this broccoli smells horrible. Then is that a negative comment about the broccoli or is it a negative remark about the mother's cooking? And then how does the mother respond? And it really shows the intricacies of communication. But I started back then and I've done many things over the years. Um, And I'm fortunate enough to do the Brain Bro podcast now, which really, you know, it's funny. I started off doing it is because I love horror, of course, and I've done it for a while. And as you know, I've acted in a few things and continue to be sort of involved with those things. And I was kind of doing it as sort of a fun way to connect with people, but I'm finding it's actually become much more important than that as people are finding value in it. So, um, I, which is positive, right? It's not like I'm going to be like, oh my gosh, I can't help people, but it actually is positive. I think to your point about breaking down stigma. Oh, that's a, I love your show. Oh, thanks. Thanks. <laughs> I love that you, you have a lot of Facebook interaction too. You ask a lot of, um, you ask a lot of really good, deep questions. Hmm. 
And I know that there's, you know, you, you link some horror in there and whatnot, which I think is great because I think, I don't know, there's like, um, for me, it's almost like a trifecta connection, if you will, between like true crime, horror and mm-hmm. mental health. Mm. Uh, because there's a lot of true crime, you know, a lot um, that are because of something mental health. You know, if that makes sense. That's right. Yeah, it does. Um, and then, you know, then there'll be a horror movie that is based off of a true crime event. That's right. And it just kind of goes around. So I like that a lot. It's very interesting to me. Um, and I, I, I was so excited when you put the show out. I know I'm gushing a lot, but <laughs> I was excited when you put the show out because I was like, this is what I want to see. Like this kind of stuff, like how you've linked the horror and, you know, the deep psychological stuff to it. I think a lot more people should like mm. get into that kind of, I think that's a cool topic to have out there. Well, I appreciate the gushing and, and the comments on that because honestly, I think it's, and it's, it's, you know, it's not about me, right? It's about getting the message out. And I think that's what Mental Health Awareness Month is. And, you know, I'm not sure how familiar people are with NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. And they're an organization that I've worked with probably about a decade or so ago at this point. And they really um, join this whole approach to Mental Health Month. When Mental Health Month is this national movement with multiple different organizations, and it's about fighting stigma, it's about providing support, it's about educating the public, and it's about advocating for policies. And I think the more people talk about it, and you know, not everybody's going to go and read a whole journal article on mental health, right? I mean, and this isn't a humble brag, but like in my past life, I've been published in a couple of different things and no one's going to go and read about (laughs) in the journal of hospital psychiatry, for instance, a whole big article, but they may be more prone to pay attention if they see, uh, you know, um, Hannah Fearman, for instance, from VHF, VHS, who is on uh, talking about struggles that she has about fear of driving in a situation, right? So I think people may pay more attention and I think shows like yours and talking about it as well, same thing. People are like, all right, I'm going to watch Joe cook her cool stuff that she's doing or get the any last words in. But then also saying, okay, well, maybe Joe's, you know, she's cool and she's talking about mental health and maybe I should pay attention. Yeah, I, I, I honestly do think that it should be more. I think a lot more people should talk about that. I, I kind of yeah. feel, I kind of feel maybe, maybe this is a little out there, but I think that it's kind of our duty in a small sense as people who are out there with an audience to promote things like this because we do have you know if it's not ourselves we have viewers out there who are struggling and sometimes they do watch us because it's some kind of a um I don't want to say comfort like we're all that or anything but you know like (laughs) it's it's I guess it is like it's like a comfort it's something that it happens every week or every so often something they can look forward to That's that's positive um, so I, I kind of feel in some small way that, that we kind of should have that initiative to go out there and help other people. Um, yeah. every once in a while, at least, I mean, not just, you know, for this month, but you know, every once in a while, just kind of throw it out there or find a, a segue into it somehow. Yeah, that, that's right. No, I think that's, I, I, you know, I think that's a very profound thing to say, right? People that are in the spotlight. And again, I, I, as you said, our spotlight's a little smaller than others, but at least it's there and people are paying attention. Uh, in all sorts of ways, right? So why not influence that way? And it makes sense. It's it's almost like a it's a responsibility almost to be able to do that. And if you can help people in the process, I think that's amazing. So well said. Thank you, thank you, sir. Sure. <sighs> and um, just to throw out there, besides uh, Mark having links in the in the description for uh, Brain Burrow for YouTube and uh, the audio podcast site, fr- Frizzy is it Frizzy? Frizzy? Oh, it's um Buzzsprout. Wait, the, the audio, okay. Right, yeah. yeah. It's, again, and well, we all use different platforms, right? But if you go yeah. to the Buzzsprout site, and I can't remember if I linked to it or not, you can find, you know, through Spotify. Basically, if you do a search for Brain Burrow on any of the po- uh, podcast uh, platforms, Spotify, you know, whatever. Even if you use your Alexa and say it, you can have it play it, you know. I'm sure, well, anybody that does podcasting, you know, you can just access it anywhere you get that, so. Well, the both links are in the description. I just forgot what the one was called. It, it was right. different, new for me. But um, on top of that, there is the link for uh, substance abuse and mental health, or um, oh my gosh, hotline. It's not a hotline. Yeah. It's a link. I forgot. It's it's some abbreviation I can't even remember. So I was trying to like memorize what it stands for. 
but the link is in the description. If you or somebody you know um, is experiencing um, some kind of mental health issue or if you'd like to educate yourself more on one of those, whether it's substance abuse or mental health or yeah. one because of the other, the link is in the description below. You guys can check that out or pass it along if need be. So. Yeah. I love how you do that, right? It's it's not just about identifying things that are going on. It's saying, okay, if you're struggling with this, contact that number. So it's fantastic you put that out there, Joe. Thank you. I just feel like, you know, if I'm going to talk about it, I might as well put something that people well, can right. go to at least. <laughs> well, and that's right. And, you know, even the National Alliance on Mental Illness, you know, people, there's a number. And people can go to that site, which is just uh, NAMI.org. Um, they have their own helpline as well. There's a, there's a lot. I mean, we live in, in such a great age now where we can easily access uh, these resources that are available to your point. Yeah, we just need to get it out there more. So people right. are more aware of it. Uh, but I wanted to talk about a little bit, not just this, because I didn't want it to feel so like, um, you know, like, mm, so sad, but <laughs> I wanted it to be a little fun too. And kind of like, you know, dig into, you know, some about what your, your show is about as well. Mm, thank um, you. Well, what you also post on, you know, Facebook as far as asking deep questions in relation to horror. Um, and I wanted to know, because I know we can't, we can't diagnose, we can only speculate or whatever you want to call it. Right. But um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you whether know all, or the, not, all the lingo. Right. Whether or not these are fictional hmm. or real people. <laughs> um, but do you think that people with depression or any other kind of mental illness are more drawn to watching horror than people who don't? Yes. <laughs> you, gave, you gave the disclaimer I was going to give, right? Which is just because somebody likes horror, just because they don't, or just because they suffer from some symptoms doesn't necessarily mean anything, you know, that doesn't necessarily correlate, right? But to answer your question, let's talk about depressive symptoms. You know, and again, I say depressive symptoms because it could be somebody who's diagnosed or it could be somebody who's struggling with depression, right? Um, you know, I've been throughout my career an advocate for uh, what they call universal screening for depression. So, you know, whether it's a primary care office or whether it's in the hospital, it's about screening people by skilled healthcare providers who can have a very collaborative, empathic conversation and really try to understand if people are struggling from depression or not, or anxiety as well, right? Or substance use. There's a whole, and I don't want to you know, go off on the tangents of all the, the science behind all that. But essentially, if somebody's struggling with depression, uh, it's what we call a downward spiral of depression, right? So somebody, for instance, you know, they're feeling isolated because of COVID or maybe their job, you know, laid them off or whatever. So they start feeling their confidence goes down. So as a result of their confidence goes down, maybe they drink a little more or maybe they eat some more high carbohydrate foods. Maybe they start disengaging from interactions, social interactions. And then when they do that, they feel worse about themselves. They put on weight and then in turn, they start having more symptoms and it keeps going in the spiral. So the whole purpose of Mental Health Month and universal screening and just having conversations is to try to stop that spiral so people can kind of pause and have some reflections. And then there's something called behavioral activation and sort of get reengaged in some of the activities that make them feel more like the person they were before. Now, obviously, to your point about depressive symptoms and anxiety being contagious, quote unquote, uh, you know, we're not expecting family members, for instance, to sit there and become a therapist for somebody. We want to try to guide people to reach out to the healthcare professionals because what what happens is people suffer from compassion fatigue. So you may have like a mother whose son is suffering, and then the mother feels like she's taking on the responsibilities, and the mother feels a certain way. So there's a reason why all these resources exist. So it's really about guiding people to um, these resources and. A lot of primary care offices have resources as well where they can connect people, especially if people have a great relationship with their primary care office. But to your point and question about horror, if somebody's feeling, for instance, disengaged from society, you know, maybe they get a comfort in watching a horror movie, right? Maybe they feel a comfort in feeling something if they see gore or violence or, or whatever. Or maybe they connect with somebody who's feeling isolated in the movies, like um, the movie May, for instance, or all these movies where there's, or, or Ginger Snaps. I'm trying to think of like people that feel kind of marginalized from society, maybe feel a certain connection with that. And if somebody's suffering from anxiety or some other, you know, symptoms or they actually are diagnosed, 
uh, there's a lot of activities people can do to distract themselves in moments of anxiety and activities that are not involving substance abuse, for instance, or other harmful activities. Uh, there's an acronym called um, WISE MIND ACCEPTS, A-C-C-E-P-T-S, which is the acronym ACCEPTS, and I remember off the top of my head, is really about techniques you can use to distract yourself. So maybe if you're feeling anxiety or you're feeling you're ruminating your thoughts, maybe you go out there and you listen to a certain music that's the opposite of what you feel, right? So it's not about removing yourself and separating yourself from your responsibilities and things, because that could cause you to feel worse if it goes down the spiral, but distracting yourself in the moment using healthy activities. So if anybody wants to search for that, um, if you look up the term wise mind, accepts, A-C-C-E-P-T-S, which gives you some strategies for distracting yourself in the moment with anxiety, which to your point could include watching a horror movie. Okay. <laughs> that may have been a lot more than you were uh, kind of thinking about, but uh, so what I'm saying is they could be very therapeutic to help people through either depressive symptoms or anxious symptoms. Okay. That kind of reminds me of, of um, what is it called? Grounding? Or five, four, three, two, one, like five things you can see, four things you can touch yeah. or smell or something like that. Kind that's of, right. It's kind yeah, of resetting. Kind of and, of that's right. That's right. And there's, to your point, there's so many different resources out there and they're meant to kind of reset yourself, stop perseverating thoughts. And, and you're right. That's a great point, Joe. Okay. Okay. Cool. Real quick, we've got comments. Oh, geez. Um, okay. Richard says, hey, Joe, hey, Mark. Um, and then he also said, oh. I would tune in to watch Joe watch Nicolas Cage and Corey Feldman fight crime together. I ah, cannot stand Corey Feldman. <laughs> and he's a, mm, mm, mm. let me catch that guy in the back alley. I'll just say that right now. <laughs> and Nicolas Cage just creeps me the hell out. Like he's just very awkward and creepy to watch. <laughs> he's a good actor. Don't get me wrong, but he's just got like this element of just creepo to me <laughs> that I just can't watch him. <laughs> <laughs> now, if this was my show, Joe, I'd say, Joe, tell me a bit more about why you feel that way about Nicholas Cage. <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> How does that make you feel? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. The stereotypical therapeutic question, but yes, you were right. So, uh, Richard also says uh, Dallas Cowboys quarterback uh, Dak Prescott is mm. bringing more mental health awareness to the NFL. I haven't heard of any other player doing that in a major sporting league. Maybe I'm out of the loop. Wow, I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. Because, yeah, they go through a lot of stuff, too. Like, um, was that Aaron Hernandez? He, the, um, who murdered, um, who was going around, like, doing all kinds of bad stuff, and he got caught up for murder. Mm. Um, yeah, and they yeah. blamed it on getting hit in the head, like, over and over and over again. They start getting, like, kind of yeah. off. Yeah, so. I mean, I, I mean, the brain's a uh, wonderfully complex and yet not that understood you know, organ that we have. So you never, you never know what may happen. Um, but I think also sporting sport and even acting, right? Even acting itself could cause, if you're not careful, some symptoms to exacerbate, right? Going on auditions and not getting the auditions could have, you have a certain feeling like, why am I not good enough? You know, I mean, think of it, right? The whole film and, and also sports, uh, you know, scenario is you're constantly on display. You're constantly trying to perform. You're looking for approval. You're looking for direction. It's, it's, um, I could see how there could be a lot of um, mental health uh, issues in, in the film industry and also in, in sporting events as well. Absolutely. There's a, one question I used to ask um, people. I want to say it might have been at the beginning, like maybe the beginning or maybe somewhere in the middle. But I would ask people, you know, who would get into like these really deep roles, mm -hmm. like whether they're like a killer or they're like, you know, super depressed and they're having to like sob and cry. Like they're in just such despair and heartache and sorrow. It's like, how do you feel? Like, I, I know it, it's difficult to get yourself in that mindset, but how do you feel coming out of that? Like, how do you get yourself out of that? Like if you're, you know, you're just so broken hearted, it took you so much effort to get to that point. How does it affect you afterwards kind of deal? Yeah, I mean, that's a great call out on that. I mean, you always hear about the sort of the stories, you know, you always hear that Heath Ledger, of course, is probably the most popular story, right, where you hear about that. Um, you know, I'm, as you know, fairly new to the acting business. So it's not like I've had some sort of role where that's been my whole part. I think that, but I will say the closest I came without giving away any roles um, that I've been in, there was a role where I had to play somebody who was very low confidence, whose communication was very, you know, he, he non-confrontational and he was interacting with people that were constantly putting him down. 
So to just to kind of get in that role and like making myself smaller. And I just found myself on set almost kind of, you know, like feeling that way, you know, which is not me. It's not me at all. So it was just definitely very interesting to kind of do that. And that's my point of bringing it up is again, it, this hasn't been my career. So I think um, just even feeling a small little part of that in that small role gave me some insight of what some of these people must go to go through as they try to take on some of these roles for, to your point, a longer period of time with much more mental anguish. Absolutely. I mean, did, did you feel that you had like a little bit of an issue coming back from that or? Well, I mean, no, uh, not necessarily. Uh, but again, I'm, I, I can't speak to people that have been doing it longer, but during the set on that day, like if people were like in between takes or going from one location to another, you know what I mean? On, on the days that we were shooting, I found myself still kind of in that mode. You know, I found myself doing something which I never do, which was apologizing for no reason. And I, you know, as I, I that's one of my things that I get on people, especially you, Joe. Uh, I found myself and as, we were, as we were waiting, like to, you know, in the area where we're getting, you know, the cater, catering, right? I kind of cut and, you know, cut in front of somebody and not, you know, in a malicious way, just sort of in that space. And I found myself apologizing and I'm like, wow, like I'm kind of in a mode of feeling like I'm less confident as part of that role. It was interesting. So it gave me just this much of an insight of what I'm sure other people must go through as they take on the role for months at a time. So you're saying you're cool with cutting people online is what you're saying. <laughs> well, we can go on the whole thing about apologizing <laughs> again, but I'm saying I didn't do anything that was wor warranting apologizing, let's just say. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. I'm teasing you. No, I know. I know. It's all right. It gives you pleasure, I'm sure, to call me out on some things sometimes, and that's quite okay. I deserve it most Sorry. of the time. Sorry. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, no. Oh, my gosh. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. How do you come up with the questions that you put um, – on your um, Facebook page. Yeah, so <laughs> it's it's the same way that I come up with the questions that I do during the interviews, right? It's just sort of, it's it's from doing this for a long time. I mean, keep in mind throughout my career, I've spent a lot of time talking directly to patients, to families, to healthcare providers. And in the moment, I could be talking to somebody about, I mean, I could be, oh, man, there's, I can't even, I, I'm not even, I'm trying to even think, just be like, oh, I'm having a wave of many, quite many questions. But for instance, I used to work on, project um, called the Minority AIDS Initiative in, in Pennsylvania here. And it was about connecting people that were diagnosed with HIV into um, healthcare, into, into the healthcare system. Because at the time, about 40% of people that were diagnosed with HIV never got the medical care. So I found myself engaged in, and my goal was to train others to have those conversations to promote those people's confidence. But as a result, I also talked to some of these, you know, patients. And, and my point of saying this to you is, is that you never know where a conversation is going to go. And I think I just became adept at coming up with open-ended questions and reflective statements to just kind of guide somebody through what's going on. So the questions I put out there on the, on Facebook are a little more, you know, lighthearted, but I try to combine, as you said, a combination of, okay, it's not just tell me your favorite slasher movie. It's okay. Tell me how, you know, how do you feel about this type of genre and why do you like it? You know what I mean? So it's kind of connecting it, but also getting a little more into behavior as well. Okay. And I love it. I love it a lot. There, oh, there you do have some really amazing, like really, like I said, really amazingly deep questions. And that's what oh, I love about oh. it. Cause it does, it makes people think it makes people look at each other's answers or responses too. like, Hey, Oh, that's okay. right. That's right. That's <laughs> or, right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. It's, it's basically whether it's, all of this stuff or whether it's, it's, you know, the, the other stuff that I do that pays the bills. Uh, it's, um, it's all about just trying to get people to think about themselves and ask themselves, why am I doing this? Basically it's about motivation. Okay. Now, do you think that children should be exposed to horror movies? Do you think that would have some kind of a mental impact on them? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, um, that's a, that's a great question. Or do you think uh, it's maybe how the parents handle or, um, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it sounds like you already have an answer to that question. Uh, yes, I think it's um, I think it's like anything, right? I mean, somebody could uh, go out and let's say they live in an apartment complex, and and maybe they get fearful of walking in the hallway and talking to strangers. You know, if they don't have a supportive structure, you know, in the family or in the community to help guide them through these fears or guide them through the anxieties, then they're going to react in different ways. And there's four different ways you respond to fear. One is you you know, the fighting back. One is, uh, you know, 
fleeing, one is freezing, and one is facing. Facing is the most sort of emotionally intelligent approach. But if you don't have that support to guide you in that, whether it's fear of strangers or whether it's fear of watching the Texas Chainsaw Massacre as a kid to help process it, then it doesn't matter, you know. Then, so it's really to your point about getting the support, especially during crucial stages of someone's development. Okay. So most likely no, because people don't watch their kids. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true, right? Well, and again, it's like, <laughs> you know, when I was a younger person and, um, you know, one of the ways that I dealt with my anxieties when I had it, you know, because we all have had anxieties at some point, was to play like first person shooters, get right like, doom or whatever, right? And somebody could say, those games are so violent, right? But for me, it was a way to sort of, you know, decompress and, and just kind of let some stress out. Again, they're just tools. Horror movies, violent video games are just tools that people can either use as a way to just sort of enrich their lives or it could be used as something that, you know, could influence somebody if they're not given the support system that they need. Okay. Okay. So does that mean that you're also um, against the ban of violent video games? Like, are you still looking forward to Grand Theft Auto? <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I love Grand Theft Auto. Yeah, I'm not, I, for, I'm, for me personally, I'm, I don't want to get into politics. I'm against the government banning things like that, right? Because it's a very slippery slope, right? Because you could say, well, well again, um, if there's parental groups or if there's people choose to, and listen, I'm a big fan of... Uh, what the heck? There's that website. There's even an IMDb, right? They have parents' guides on there that says yeah. here's sex, here's violence, here's whatever. Uh, I can't think of the name of the website that, that does it. It's a, it's um, and if people want to do that and they put that out there and people can choose what they want to have their kids seeing, then that is totally up to them. My issue is if people force other people to not put their products out there. And okay. so yes, I'm, I'm against the government ban of of any material, really. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> Not surprised. Oh, <laughs> uh, um, let's see. I had another question, but I got to remember which one it was because I already asked most of these. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. So why do you think horror has become so popular lately? Like all of us, have you noticed there's just been like a big boom of like horror enthusiasts? Like a lot of us have come out of the closet. I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess. I guess the question, I'll, I'm going to turn that on you for a second here. So why is it that you like horror so much? I grew up on horror. It was just mm -hmm. my, my, I was almost born on Halloween. My birth, so my birthday's mm -hmm. on November 1st. So it was oh, just, uh, ah, just missed it. Yeah. Just missed it. So I just, I just grew up in that kind of environment. Basically. Okay. So you've always, been I was indoctrinated. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I think, you know, with especially with online media, and I think people have much more access to the communities now, right? I mean, especially with the lockdowns and everything, right? People found themselves communicating a lot more online and getting connected to online communities. So listen, I even, I was on Facebook for a while and I got back into it um, in August specifically to get back into like the acting part of it and the connection. So I think the communities there, I think you can, you can easily order whatever it is you possibly want. You know, I was looking at trying to find a good um, replica of the phantasm, uh, you know, sphere, for instance, right? So so you can easily find all these different things to express yourself. And I think people are able to do that. I honestly think that the internet and those different communities has allowed us to connect in a way that we never were able to before. And the virtual nature of life with the lockdowns has sort of almost forced us, but made us feel more compelled to do it that way to get that social connection. Okay. Okay. I think mean, get anybody, people getting a little, a little dark in their heads too. And they're just wanting to go, oh, just watch horror movies. I mean, it's possible, <laughs> right? I mean, I mean, it's an escape. I mean, a lot of people, especially if they're not into horror movies, and I'm sure you know, some people that aren't, they don't understand why would they, why, why would people want to watch that and put themselves through that? But you know very well that if you're stressed about work or stressed about other things, then if you allow yourself to escape for an hour and a half and watch, Michael Myers or whatever, it's like you're more focused on that at that moment as opposed to, you know, some of the other stuff that's going on in your life, perhaps. Okay. Just watch Michael take it out on someone else for or you. something, right? <laughs> exactly. So, right. Uh, so, well, speaking of Michael, um, from all the horror movies that you've seen, is there one where a killer just is almost like to the T something that you could diagnose? <laughs> um, that's a great question. 
You know, I'm I'm a big fan of the of the movie uh, American Psycho. It's actually besides wow. the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, one of my favorites. And it's again, it's these are these are snippets of people's personality. I mean, you know what I mean? As you know, as you know, so it's hard to it's hard to say, right? I mean, I find myself, well, the funny part is, especially after getting on set, you know, now, I find myself more dissecting from, like, I wonder, did they tell this actor to do it this way? Did, what did There's a person who's directing this, did they do some research on the specific behavior? Um, I know there's been a lot of research on, not a horror movie, but the movie Joker, for instance, is about just sort of the diagnosis there, and I can't remember what they said the diagnosis was, but there's there's been a, there's a lot of um, videos out there where people are diagnosed with different characters. But again, as you know, with scripts, it's a combination of the director putting words down on paper, who may or may not have done the research, and then it's a combination of the actor kind of doing things differently. I'll just say one more thing about this. You know, in my other career, I spent a lot of time funny enough, acting as either patients or as providers uh, with my colleague who I've mentioned before, Brittany Wilson, who's a nurse. She and I have a whole series of interactions that we do where we're just kind of playing off each other and saying, this is the effective way to communicate. But it's, and we do it, you know, we've been doing this for a while. So we're able to sort of respond to each other and ad lib a lot and how to respond and show the appropriate behavior. But it's nothing at all like when you're doing this with a real patient or person who has real fears, real values and real experiences. Oh man. So do you feel that that, that that could harm, like that that can add to the stigma of people who are um, diagnosed with whatever that character is portraying in a film? Absolutely. It definitely can. Cause it's never going to be as accurate as the person who's actually experiencing it. And as you know, the horror genre, I mean, not, not even just the horror genre, Hollywood in general, films in general are, you know, they're, they're entertaining, right? So there may be things that are exaggerated, about mental illness, just as there is about anything else. I mean, I think about the, um, the the silencers on guns, right? As you know, that's one of the things where in movies, it's like, ooh, a silencer, it's totally silent on a gun. Um, in reality, that's just for effect. So there's a lot of, so you can say the same thing about conditions that are done in Hollywood as well. Okay. Have you seen the movie Split? I have seen it, actually. How did you feel about that movie? That's a great open-ended question. On, on, yeah. on, a, on a professional side and, and a, a, you know, just a, a I, patron of films. <laughs> you know, on a professional side, I mean, like, that's, an, that's another stigma, right, about, about split personalities, right? I mean, there's a combination. It's not as pervasive as I think Hollywood puts it out to be, right? Even cases that are supposedly split personalities have really not been that, whether it's somebody purposefully trying to avoid getting incarcerated or whether it's somebody who has some other diagnosis. So, I mean, again, I feel like it was for, for effect. Um, as a patron of film, I wasn't a huge fan of it. I think I, I just wasn't, I didn't, you know, specifically. I, I wasn't, I was underwhelmed by, and I'm not saying that, um, what's the actor's name? Mick James Hilton. McAvoy. Yeah, right, right. I mean, I think he did an excellent job of trying to incorporate all the different characters. I just, uh, you know, it's again, that's a perfect example of something that has played to dramatic effect. Okay. I, I, I was impressed by how quickly he could change from mm -hmm. one to the other. I oh, thought I that was, supposedly he did it without like stopping. That's pretty, I mean, yeah. I mean, I think he did an excellent job of portraying these multiple different characters. Yeah. But, yeah, yeah. I would, I don't believe, I, I've never personally met anybody with oh, DID or whatever it's called. Oh, dissociative, um, but, yeah, right. Yeah, is that what it's called, DID? <laughs> Uh, dissociative person. Well, I can't actually remember what it's called off the top of my head. It's it's so rare, and it's definitely not even something that. Yeah, that's why I'm like, like I've never met a anybody. Dissociative like identity that. disorder, right? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, I've never met anybody like that personally. I yeah. but I first I just I honestly can't believe that people would behave like that with it. But then again, at the same time, because I'm uneducated in it completely. Well, not completely a lot, but, um, <laughs> and not experiencing it, I sit there and think, well, maybe, I think maybe, I don't know, because I've never met anybody, and I don't really know that much about it, because it's not something that's talked about very often. And it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's truly not, you know, that common either, right? I mean, there's also, I, yeah. and I think that's, I think that's what it is, right? There's a lot of these diagnoses out there, especially in Hollywood that are in the film industry, which are very, um, you know, they're, I don't want to say they're sexy, but there's something that like, oh, like, you know, even American Psycho, right? It's dramatic and it's written, you know, if you read the actual book, it's even more dramatic, right? I'm not watching that as, 
oh my gosh, this person has this or that, you know, this person, this is just an entertaining movie for me right. and, 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 you know, and Bateman as he does his things, but, but less exciting to watch are people that are struggling with day-to-day -day depressive symptoms or anxious symptoms or, or, you know, alcohol abuse that may not be, you know, Nicolas Cage and uh, what's the movie he was in leaving Las Vegas or whatever it was, the one where he was, oh. into Las I can't yeah. think of it, whatever. Like, I mean, real alcoholism or people waking up in the morning and putting, you know, and feeling that they can't focus on the day unless they have a shot of um, whiskey in their coffee. You know, I mean, there's the real life day to day mental illness or people that are struggling with these symptoms. I mean, it's not glamorous. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it's just and again, I think that's what this is all about. Mental Health Month is knowing that you're not alone. And many, many people at many different times in their life suffer from a lot of these same symptoms. Absolutely, especially within, you know, I think you said it even earlier, you know, this past year that we've had, you know, a lot right. of people are at home right now. You know, people are uncertain about things, you know, whether it's, you know, financially or their home security or job security, whatever it may be. Um, just everybody's kind of feeling it in some way, shape or form right now, whether or not you are diagnosed with some, something, everybody is pretty much affected right now. That's right. That's right. And again, you could have many of those symptoms without actually being diagnosed. And again, I think people, there's lots of resources available. And again, um, a lot of primary care offices, specifically, if you have a relationship with your primary care office, it's, you know, it's an opportunity to have some conversations about those things as well. And I'm not saying that they would, and some of them, you know, depending on the situation and depending on how you're feeling or the severity of what you're feeling, you could partner with your primary care team. Or they would partner with you and getting to the person who would actually be. Because a lot of these offices have um, networks of, and it's not even about psychiatry, or it's not even just about medication. It could be therapy. It could be group discussions. There's all sorts of, there's so many options available out there. Absolutely. It's just we need to get it out there more where, you know, it's easily available to people to to access this stuff. Because I don't, it's just behavioral health and dentistry. I don't know why these aren't pushed more because they're so important to your well-being, believe that's it or right. not. That's right. Yeah. That, no, you're you're entirely right about that. And I think it's just, you know, and, and a lot of um, physicians, for instance, and nurses and others, they just, they're not trained on this. You know what I mean? And again, people go to school for this or they're just kind of trained in other areas and they may not feel comfortable having them some of these conversations with patients either. So a lot of my career was being was training different healthcare professionals, pharmacists, physicians, nurses, medical assistants, ha to have these types of conversations with patients so they feel more confident themselves. Right. I'm just I'm kind of putting myself out there a little bit, but it's like you said about, you know, some some aren't, you know, really that prepared to talk to us about that or they're not educated enough to talk to that. That's right. My my therapist that I have She's never dealt with anybody who's had bipolar two disorder before. Hmm. I'm like her first person that she's ever had to deal with. She's not even really familiar with bipolar itself. So she's wow. having to like learn as I'm going through this because I was just diagnosed with this like less than a year ago. Wow. So that and a whole other bunch of stuff. But this one in particular, she, she has no experience or knowledge of at all. And you would kind of think like somebody who's in behavioral health, I mean, it's just, I guess it's just an assumption, yeah. you know, that you would think that somebody in behavioral health would have some kind of knowledge with it, but I don't know how common, I don't think bipolar is that common. I'm, is it or is it? I, I mean, don't know. It, it's, there's definitely a lot of people that struggle with it. Right. I mean, and when we talk about, for instance, um, DID, which is so rare, but you know, bipolar, right. bipolar, the different levels of bipolar uh, diagnosis are definitely something that comes up. And again, I can't speak to you know w w with your therapist. I think it's as long as you're feeling supportive and you're she's part of that partnering with you on the journey. I mean, I think as long as your needs are being met, then it's working for you. You know, right. but I mean, that's up to. You. I mean, we'll have to talk about this right now. And first of all, I'll give you um, an affirmation for even being willing to share about it. What you what you you're diagnosed. Mm -hmm the diagnosis was. So I think that says a lot about you. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you for listening. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, we can, I mean, we can definitely talk about it if you ever want to about just, and again, it's not me. It's just, it's just one of the biggest things that I've seen out there in healthcare is patients feel like they don't have a say in their care. And you do, you have a say in your care. If you don't feel like you're being met as far as your healthcare goals, and I'm not saying that you're not, but I'm saying right. you have, 
you have a right and, and, and you, you know, to be able to say, you know what, this isn't, here's my needs. And, um, just in, in vote voice those needs. And if healthcare professionals aren't meeting those needs, then there's an opportunity to find someone that is. Right. And a lot of people are scared too about, um, you know, I'm going to be forced to be on medication or I'm going to be forced to do this or do that. So it really kind of deters some people from even wanting to go because That's right. they've heard some things about medication or they've read some things about medication and, or they just, they don't want to be that person. That's right. You know, I don't want to have to be on, I mean, cause you know, I've gone through that too. I don't want to have to be on pills the rest of my life do function like a somewhat normal human being like right. that's bullshit. But you know what? It's that's life. Right. Life is bullshit, but you're right though. You don't have to, you don't have to do with what's just given to you just because they're just handing it to you. You, you have the right to say, Hey, you know, I would like to explore other options or I don't feel like, this is really working for me or that you're really right for me. I'd like to go somewhere else. Or That's right. Something. That's right. Especially when it comes to mental health, right? I mean, we're talking about rebuilding uh, and making, you know, your confidence, you know, and if you're not getting your needs and, and it's ironic, right? Because if you're suffering from depressive symptoms or lower confidence, then you're, you don't want to upset your therapist, you know, right. so you're afraid to say something. So it's kind of a, you know, so again, it's worth, I mean, that's what, they are trained to do is to have those type of conversations. And trust me, I've been in situations where I've seen it or even said things to me like, hey, I don't feel like you're listening to me. You know what I mean? So I think there's, it's it's all part of it. And, and as far as medications, I mean, that's another big thing that comes up as well. I don't know. There's, there's, there's so much that goes into this, which is why I've spent 27 years in healthcare. There's still so much work to do, to your oh point. My, I right. bet. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's, I can't imagine. <laughs> well, that's, that's all right, but it's it's still it's a. But I think to your point, a lot of this, what we're doing, what we're doing on on this is is continue is also an important part of this conversation as well. Okay, right. we've got more comments real quick. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, yeah, Richard said uh, I was driving and missed some stuff. Did you guys talk about the movie Joker? It's pretty much about mental health. Yeah. We yeah, yeah, we just mentioned this to your point, um, and there's a lot of different what's the word things where they delve into that out there. And I would definitely recommend if people are interested in understanding the mental health um, aspect of that film, there's a lot of um, in-depth podcast information on that. So good call out. Yeah. I want, I still haven't seen it yet. My, my guy has oh. seen it. Like, I think he's seen it like two or three times. Oh. And every time he watches it, he watches it when I'm not here oh, no. <laughs> or when I'm off doing something else and I come out and it's like in the middle of it, or it's like at the end of it, I was like, son of a bitch, you watch it again. How <laughs> many? Just wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like you two need to have a talk about that. <laughs> How does that make you feel? <laughs> oh my gosh. Richard says, uh, I still have yet to see a therapist. I've been recommended by my doctor. I'm just a procrastinator. It happens. It happens. But, you know, when you're ready, I'm sure you'll go. Yeah. I think, Richard, you know, and thanks for sharing that. I know, again, um, sharing these things is you're sharing your vulnerabilities. So I want to give you credit for that. And I think the question you have to ask yourself, Richard, is um, in your life, you know, what would it take? What would it, what would it take in your life to say, okay, I am going to contact the therapist. And I can, that's a question you can answer for yourself as you reflect on it, you know? So I think it's, um, yeah, there's a lot of self-reflective questions I think to ask yourself and how you see it fitting into your life. Oh, I think I see how it's fitting right now. Richard, Richard. <laughs> I'm going to get you, dude. He says, I take pills. I also drink a lot when I can afford it. Yeah. I mean, that's, um, and again, you. <laughs> you know, as individuals, you know, we all have to make our own choices about our lives, right? People can help guide us, but ultimately it's up to us to make the choice and we have to weigh the pros and cons and none of us are in this alone. So I think it's really about Richard deciding what type of support you need to make any type of decisions that you make and, and how important it is to you. There's three elements of a behavior change. It's a behavior change triangle. It's the knowledge of the change. It's the importance you put on the change and it's a confidence to make the change. So it's really about, you know, Richard may know, for instance, what therapy does for him, could do for him or cutting down on drinking. Uh, he may put an importance on it, but his confidence may be low. And the question is, what would it take to increase confidence? So those, I mean, so it's, it's always just thinking it behavior, human behavior is very complex, but again, Richard, as, as always, there's, um, depending on how you're feeling and what you're sharing, there's a, the helpline that was put out there. Again, helpline is an interesting word, but it's, it doesn't mean if you call people are going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be at your house, but it's more about just talking to somebody, talking to somebody about some things. So, yeah. 
because sometimes we just need um, a stranger's ear because sometimes that's more comforting, you know, less feels less judgmental that's than right. talking to somebody, you know, you know, because like you said, you're being vulnerable. You're, 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 you're letting everybody know your vulnerabilities and sometimes we don't want to talk to other people. So I yeah. think that the lines are like lines, hotlines, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. Uh, Helplines, you know, that they, they are, I think they are very beneficial. I think, man, I just think more people need to be aware of this stuff. It's just so it's, it's kind of crappy that it feels like it's, it's dwindled just to a month and a month that not a lot of people even know about. That's right. Well, and I think to your point, there's helplines where, like, even NAMI, I just looked it up just now. There's a 1-800-950-NAMI, N-A-M-I, or go to the site. Or if it's a crisis, you know, there's places to call directly as well. So, um, but again, I would And then also check with your your local, you know, um, your local health, mental health services that you have. I mean, if if you're worried about insurance, I wouldn't even worry about insurance. There's a lot of, they can't, they're they're not going to turn you away if you're in a crisis. You know, right. you need help. They're going to help you. There's, I know it's kind of scary because been there, done that, but there's a lot of mental health facilities that you can also go to as a last resort. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to lock you up for three days or anything, you know, but That's right. you know, you can go and, and get some kind of help. Um, especially if you're at that point, you know, which is, it's really just best to go. That's right. That's right. And there's, and to your point, not only are there local, I mean, for a long time, I worked in um, considered federally underserved areas where people like didn't have the resources. And there's a lot of resources available. Uh, even the pharmaceutical companies, right? They have a lot of programs that are available if the, if medications needed. And there's samples that are given out in some of the offices. It's there's, there's that's I think the biggest other point here is there's so many resources that are available, it, it's, especially if you're having financial struggles. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. They it, it's just. Like I keep saying, it's just not, it's not pushed out there. It's just right. not freaking pushed. Like <laughs> That's right. Oh my God. <laughs> no, you're right. You're right. And then there's also it's kind of into a same same topic, but a different branch of it, if you will. Um, there's you know, there's there's also a lot of mindsets too in other ways, like with men. Not mm-hmm. all men, but mm-hmm. a lot of men won't go to therapy. They won't go and seek help because you you're a man, you're supposed to be strong, you know, you're supposed to be right. tough, you're supposed to take it, you're supposed to handle it, that's just life, you don't show emotion. And that's kind of, that hurts my heart. It really hurts mm. my heart that, that men feel that they have to do that because you don't have to, you don't have to suffer that way because I'm sorry, this whole like, oh, mental illness is a superpower. Psh, no, it's not, are you serious? Mm. This isn't a beautiful mind. I'm not Russell Crowe. I don't see like numbers everywhere and I'm just a mathematician, that, that's, no. <laughs> yeah, great, great point about that. No, you're right, and and you know some cultures, for instance, value not talking about your mental, you know, any any health conditions more than others, and it's just, and again, just because somebody's in one culture or another doesn't mean anything. But as individuals, there's so many things that make us the complex beings we are that influence our ability to, you know, decide to have a Snickers bar or a glass of water. You know what I mean? We're we're <laughs> we're faced with countless decisions every day, and it's um it's it's interesting. That's all. So. Do you have any uh, do you have any advice for anybody out there who think they might be having a hard time or who is definitely having a hard time or know somebody who might be having a hard time? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. I think support is there. Right. It, it's I think what if somebody's struggling with somebody who's having a hard time, I think it's um, your best bet is to listen, because what happens is, is if if I'm if you know, I'm struggling with something and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I I don't know how I can go on each day. I can't even get out of bed because my, you know, I'm feeling so down. If somebody tells me well-intended, oh, I understand how you feel. And here's what I go through. Then all of a sudden, you know, it's like, okay, you're not even listening to me. Or if I say I'm really struggling and somebody says, you'll be okay. Then it's like, okay, I, I don't feel that way. So I think the best thing you can do is listen as somebody who's with somebody and just say, okay, it sounds like, you know, it is an empathic statement goes a long way. There's a video out there called, it's not about the nail. Uh, if people want to look that up, just look it up on YouTube. It's like a minute and a half and it's about this person. It's kind of comical. And the person, the woman is, she has a nail in her head and it's again, it's all, it's comically done. And her person she's talking to on the couch, he keeps on saying, just take the nail out. And she keeps on saying, well, I, you know, I, I have this pain here and he's like, just do this. And she's like, just, listen. And he basically just listens to her and then she felt heard. 
So I think the biggest thing you can do is listen to somebody who's struggling. But again, there's research, depending on how things are going, the ultimate goal is to try to connect people to the resources that are out there. But if you're a partner, if you're somebody with somebody who's struggling with anything, it's just take a little more time listening. Absolutely. Absolutely. Be kind to each other. That's Be right. nice to each other. Care That's about right. each other because we're That's here right. with each other. So <laughs> That's right. Exactly. Well said. Uh, Richard says real quick, uh, the beautiful mind movie blue. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so... Um, oh my gosh. He said, or enjoy some M berries, which I don't know if you're familiar with the M berries, the miracle berries. They make sour sweet. It's a oh. natural plant. Well, there I, you go. There's, there's something right there. It's a nice distraction. It, exactly. It, re it really is. Cause it's a mind trip. It is That's, a mind trip. There you go. That's great. It's a great example, actually. Richard. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, guys, we are coming up to the end here. I just want to remind you real quick. You can check out Mark D. Valente show Brain Burrow on YouTube. Uh, the link is in the description below, along with the uh, the link for his audio uh, podcast site, and also the um, the link and the number for substance abuse mental health help mental health awareness. Forgot what the last letter meant. It's fine. Click on that if uh, if you or somebody you know is struggling or. Um, or you think you or someone you know is struggling and needs help, or if you would like a little bit more information on some of these things, um, check those out. This is National Mental Health Awareness Month, but I would like I would like to see more people put it out there a little bit more than just during this month. And I'm really glad that you're doing the show that you're doing because it brings it out there every day. Hmm. So, well, you know what I mean, like in a in a way, I guess. Of, it does. It know. does. We don't we don't necessarily. St it delves as much into all the specific diagnosis. It's more about people that are talking through different things about themselves and how they deal, how they deal with day-to-day -day stresses. And I think that's what it is. So thank you. Thanks for calling that out, Joe. Therapeutic horror. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Exactly. Uh, Richard says, if you have a nail in your head, you have bigger problems. <laughs> I concur. Yes. Sir. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, go check out the links below. Make sure you guys check out uh, Mark's show. And that's it for tonight, guys. Do you have any last words, Mark? Yeah, I, I think my last words are, I really appreciate your partnership, Joe, um, on, on this topic specifically, but just in general. So thank you for doing all that you do to promote positivity in the community. Thank you. And thank you, too, because you're doing a good job, too. So Thanks. you're doing an amazing job. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Keep going, man. Uh, so, you guys, thanks for joining, and I guess I'll see you guys tomorrow night. So, see you, creepy bastards, later. <laughs>